Welcome to Grumpy Strategist episode 27, the podcast from Strategic Analysis Australia on all things defence and security here in Happy Australia. I'm Michael Shoebridge and I'm joined by the Director Head of Research, Dr. Marcus Hellyer. Sorry, am I Director or Head? Yes, you are. Okay, I'm both. I'm the Directing Head of Research. Directing Head or the Head Director? Head Director, of I research. like that one. Of research. My, my massive staff will like that. Yeah. So uh, we have a few things to get through. We're going to talk about a concept that's very applicable to defence procurement and, in fact, defence capability. And shittification, I think, is the word that mm-hmm. you've, you've found. We're going to talk about the gullible goldfish phenomenon, a bit about Henderson Precinct shipbuilding stuff, and a bit about missiles, $7 mm-hmm. billion dollar missile mm-hmm. announcement. And the, the ghost fleet, the Arafura OPV, where is it now? Well, I thought that was covered under the concept of shittification. It is. It, I guess you're right there. So this word you found, you didn't make this word up. No, you? no, but hang on, hang on. You're trying to change the subject, Michael. There is a, an important matter of business we have to cover. We talk a lot about accountability here. It's We're important. going to have an exercise in accountability here. I want to draw your attention, Michael, to the fact that in our last podcast, we referred to The Princess Bride, yes, great movie, mm-hmm. and there is that quote there, I do not think this word means what you think it means. And I think the word in question in the podcast was accelerate, yes, because defence seems to think accelerate means slow down. But anyway, you ascribed that quote... To the character Fezzet, played by the professional French wrestler Andre the Giant. As one of our eagle-eared listeners kindly pointed out, it was, in fact, the character Inigo Montoya, played by Mandy Patinkin. Oh, I feel terrible because Inigo Montoya has had a life of suffering and things done to him that shouldn't have happened. So let me apologise, not just to our listeners, but to Inigo himself, because he's one of my personal icons and I I do feel awful. Sorry, that's the extent of accountability. No, I, I was just about to say, I think the problem here is I trust too much. Uh, One of the many interns here at Strategic Analysis Australia may not have done proper research. So I really feel like I'm I'm the victim. So which intern are we talking about here? Well, they're not here now. Right, okay. Yeah, I feel, I mean, I feel bad, but I really think I'm the victim. Well, I think, Michael, to show true accountability, you need to fall on your sword. I expect your letter of resignation on my desk tomorrow morning but could you please edit the podcast first and put it on the website before you go and then be gone well i I will commit to that but yeah i we don't have any interns here at (laughs) saa that was my mistake absolutely my mistake more obfuscation (laughs) where where is this heading i was thinking robo debt afghan war crimes (laughs) you clearly uh, recruiting you you know that the too, role, much, role too goal. much of your career in the Department of Defence. Well, so I think process deep was wide, the problem. bad habits there, Michael. Process was the problem. There's no sing- single individual who could be held accountable. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if, if you were an unaccountable individual in defence, by now, after leaving defence, you would be the chairman of the board of a very large arms company. So the, the analogy doesn't work that way. It well. doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, my apologies. So why don't we start... And shittification is something that's come out of the tech world, isn't it? Yeah, so in shittification was actually the American Dialect Society's 2023 word of the year. I'll give you a very brief definition taken from Wikipedia, the, the source Ooh. of all wisdom. And shittification, alternately, crapification or platform decay, I don't, platform decay, it doesn't quite have the that's, same resonance, it have the same is zip. a pattern in which online products and services decline in quality. Initially, vendors create high quality offerings to attract users then they degrade those offerings to better serve business companies and finally degrade their services to users and business customers to maximize profits for shareholders so they suck in customers and business providers capture and build the market capture and build the market yeah and then just degrade it all yeah so first of all you suck everybody in to use your platform they get hooked on that platform they've got sunk costs on the platform then you start screwing the the common guy the customers yeah yep. but then by putting in more advertising like you do a google search now you know and at the top are all these ads you know you have are this, they ads? and you don't Gosh, know i thought it was just <laughs> genuine objective results oh that's the you sponsored link sucker. there right. you poor sucker Yes, I get it. But then they start screwing the business users as well, like on eBay or Amazon, and they start jacking up the fees for them them as well. So everybody loses except the, the platform provider. 
at the middle. You know but what I'm then thinking? the key thing is then the platform provider dies as mm. well. I'm thinking of Defence's Enterprise Resource Planning Initiative brought to us by the Mega Corporation SAP, which was all things to all people when it started. It was going to do logistics, finance, personnel. It now looks like it's being um, just continually de-scoped and extended and delayed. So it's a perfect example of what you're talking about. Well, the, I agree. And I think when you look at defence, you can see all kinds of examples. But to me, probably the most relevant uh, example is actually the shipbuilding program. You know, So if we cast our minds back, this was meant to solve everybody's problems. It was going to mm-hmm. provide capability when we needed it. Yep. It was going to provide a enduring industrial base. It was yep. going to create jobs. And most importantly, it was going to provide value for the Australians in terms of relevant Capability. It was a cheaper way of getting <laughs> effective naval capability faster, wasn't it? Yes, well, I with mean, secure, if, high-paying jobs. I mean, you, what was not to like? If you believe that, you know, then there's a number of bridges to, you, to sell you. But it is classic example of, of insurification. It was meant to be this fantastic thing that was going to solve all of our problems and and work for everybody. But what have we actually got out of it? We are now, if we go back to say 2016, when the previous government mm-hmm. started this this plan, approving the attack class submarine 2017 it put out its naval shipbuilding plan which by the way has yep. not been updated despite promises yep. by both governments 2018 2018 the approval of the arafura opb yep. and, the and the hunter where are we at now we have spent well over 10 billion dollars going down this path and we have been and shitified we have been massively in shitified so the attack class four billion dollars gone nothing for it yep. and it, it and the thing about insurification is, at least for some period of time, you've got the IT provider, the platform provider, it's a spider in the middle making lots and lots of money. Yes. It's hard to look at... Who's, who's <laughs> the winner here? <laughs> who's the winner here? I mean, certainly, Naval, the French shipbuilding company, was making some money, but they've got massively burned over yep. this. We look yep. at the OPV pro- program, which we'll go into more detail later. Who's won out of that? Lursen, the German company that won the contract, they just put out a, an announcement saying, we're leaving. Yeah, they've we're- just exited <laughs> stage left, haven't <laughs> we're, they? And we're- they, were, they were thinking they were a continuous shipbuilding partner. Correct. And they saw this as like, I think, Naval as a springboard into these huge Asia Pacific yeah. markets. Yeah. So Lursen are gone. They've been burned. You sort of look at their Australian partner, Civmec, and uh, Civmec have got to be thinking gosh maybe oil and gas is more reliable yeah than this well they're and, a bit like a jilted bride who's now kind of damaged by the experience and then you know the mo- most the most grotesque program of all the hunter which is now gone from 30 to 45 billion 47 but from yeah. nine down to six ships that's Still going, but we are a decade away from having any capability whatsoever. If you look at who is the one winner out of this, you've got to say BAE. Well, and the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the Hunter plus Snorkus is the kind of insurance policy for BAE, isn't it? It's just a mainline access to the Australian Treasury because they're now too big to fail. Too big to fail. And unfortunately, Mr. Miles, the Deputy Prime Minister and occasionally seems to be acting as Defence Minister, seems to think the term too big to fail is a good thing. Yeah. Newsflash, too big yeah. to fail is a bad thing. Well, Enron. Enron. <laughs> it is Enron, <laughs> the US financial yeah. sector in the global financial crisis. So. Yeah. And you can tell yourself you're too big to fail and you can still fail is the other thing about that term. So the OPV, the Arafura class, this That's another example, isn't it, of this problem of just you get less and less and less until are you getting anything at all? However, um, I think the term you've coined for it is, is the OPV Australia's potential ghost fleet? Well, in a good way and a bad way. <laughs> well, so the term ghost fleet last year, around about this time last year, the, the US Navy's uncrewed fleet visited Australia. They'd actually been doing operations in the Gulf, in Ooh. the Middle East, and on their way home, they stopped by here and actually sailed into Sydney Harbour, demonstrating that this it's real. To, to quote a senior Australian Navy officer, it is live. This wasn't in a test tank, though, was it? It was in Sydney Harbour. <laughs> yeah. They sailed up Sydney Harbour. You know, so there's the US ghost 
ghost fleet. And I go, well, we also have a ghost fleet. And that is the Arafura class OPV, which six of them are in construction. But where what's where happened? So, you know, I went back to an, a reliable source of data, which is the Australian National Audit Office's major projects report. So the first one was meant to be handed over to the Department of Defence in December 2021. So that's nearly three years ago. That was shifted. That date was then shifted to January 2024. So even Ooh. we're almost blown a year past the revised date. And IOC's initial operating capabilities, so the first one actually be able yep. to be deployed, was meant to be December 2022, so it's nearly two, two years, years ago. ago. And that was revised to August 2024. So we've blown past that as well. And you will also recall, Michael, from the Surface Fleet review, that there was a recommendation adopted by the government to cut the original buy of 12 Ooh, down, down to 6, six. Yep. because we don't actually know what we want to use these yes. ships for. Well, there was no. an elliptic statement about maybe the Navy should think about what they might use these things for because their original purpose doesn't make any sense. Mm. So we've sort of ended up with this half half a fleet, Ooh. which seems to be largely built, yep. but not accepted into service. We've probably spent $2.5 billion, roughly, so well over half the And dome. we've had the shipbuilder, designer, directing mind, Lurson, exit stage Lurson left. have said, screw this, you yep, know, working off. with you guys is a not worth the effort. So yeah. they're going. So, you know, what's behind this? And of course, Defence is always very close-lipped on, on this. But again, going back to the major projects report, it does say, quote, the project is currently managing the following emergent risks. So sea trials are impacted by structural fire integrity design safety. Mm. So there seems to be a problem there, and I will say, maybe I'm spreading rumours that I've heard, but I have heard from two people inside Defence who seem to have reasonable familiar familiarity with the program, mm. that there is a major fire safety issue with the design, and that's why Defence doesn't want to accept the ships, which does, of course, raise that issue of, but wasn't this an existing in it's service an in-service design. The Brunaians have this ship. So if there's now this glaring deficiency in the design that is obvious, how did that how not did get not discovered <laughs> by looking at the Brunei example? Well, I find it completely perplexing, Michael, because as you know, as we go went back to the original selection process for both the OPVs and the future frigate, Ooh. the government directed defence to acquire an existing in-service in service existing real design. Now, we all know... To avoid problems like this. Yes, and we all know the very sorry history of the Hunter class, which did yeah. not follow that process what, at all, and the senior bureaucrats and the military officials in department basically said, screw you, government, we want this We're ship. doing this anyway, yeah. yeah. But in the case of the OPV, we did pick an existing off-the-shelf design. Mm-hmm. And so you sort of go, how how did we get to this this situation where we've built it and gone, oh, we don't Wait think it's seaworthy? But one thing that occurs to me is if it's got this major safety and fire issue, has the Australian Defence Organisation and Royal Australian Navy alerted the Brunaians? Because they could be sail sailing around in a chronic fire hazard. There's a, a, a duty of care issue here if they know about this problem. I bet they haven't done that. I, I cannot say, Michael, but I do find this to be extremely depressing in that even when we go completely off the shelf, and we did go off the shelf, well, we did strip some capabilities off it. Well, it, it had less but fire risk because it had missiles taken we, we off took it. The and missiles, the missiles could explode. And, and we downgraded the, the weight, helicopter deck. The helicopter deck. So it was. But, it should have been safer because it could do less and it had less explosives on it. So you do start to wonder, like, what hope is there for us? Like, when well, we can't even build let's, any... But let's think positively about this. What should be happening is the safety and compliance problems should be being fixed with this vessel and we shouldn't throw it away. There are lots of uses for a vessel of that size that could deploy a whole bunch of things in our big, wide Indo-Pacific region. So the worst thing, I think, would be to say, well, that's it, that, that thing's dead to me and treat it like a red-haired stepchild. The thing to do is a Get Well program and bring it into service. I have do have, to say, on it I do have a red-haired stepchild and she's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do like to think I treat her quite well, nicely. Well, maybe but... we should treat them like a good step-parent treats a red-haired stepchild. So, look, it's a good question and that 
But when so when we picked the Arafura and we decided we weren't going to replace the existing patrol boats with similar patrol boats. I will note, however, that because of the OPV problems, we now have replaced the Armadale with the patrol Catalyst, boats with an entire new fleet of, of an evolution of the Armadales. Yeah, this is an opportunity to have that kind of utility vessel that's big Ooh. enough to do a whole range of things. And I, I think the historical parallel is the the Bathurst class. From World War II. From World War II, which were sort of designed as mine sweepers, but we actually used them for a whole range of they tasks. They did a bit of escort duty, didn't they? Yep. So yep. anti-submarine duty, escort duty, troop transport. No doubt many of our listeners are aware that the Royal Australian Navy's only VC winner, so Teddy Sheehan, went down with his ship HMAS Armadale when it was sunk by the Japanese. But And also that's an, another example of great Australian black humour. We have a Prime Minister that drowns, so we have a Harold Holt memorial pool. We have Teddy Sheehan, a hero who goes down firing the gun on his ship as it sinks. We named, we a, named submarine. a submarine after him. <laughs> but so these were... The one thing we know about major conflict, as soon as the proverbial hits the fan... Everybody's like, we need more vessels. You need numbers. You can't just yeah. use cruisers and battleships and aircraft carriers. If you want to do patrol duty, you know, if you want to do escort duty, well, that's you need what I'm lots saying. The last ships. thing Can you I? want to do is turn off a live production line of a cheap and cheerful vessel. Mm. Because the Bathurst was cheap and cheerful. Yeah, and if and you had any Navy person give you their wet dream requirement about a vessel in World War II, they would not have given you the Bathurst specifications. This is the same. Right. But all of those sort of what we, the boring the kind of jobs of escort or patrolling sea lanes, all of that kind of stuff that we use the Bathurst for. And I thought the OPV could be a modern kind of yeah, equivalent well, of course. for that. Well, you, know, you, you put some UAVs on the back or you put a towed array on the back. Back. Stick you some put mines contains on it that mines, you can lay somewhere. Containerized yeah. missiles, but no. Well, you can imagine. Just well, I think we're pretty much finished on the OPV. It, it is a potential ghost fleet. Uh, it should should be resurrected, and then it's not a ghost, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, the New Zealand sinking of the that was very Manawanui, I very suppose, unfortunate. If you want people to get really nervous about fire and safety risks, pictures of that vessel catching fire and sinking after running aground uh, looks like a commercial specification vessel. That means yeah, damage it was a controllers. Commercial vessel. Yeah, so damage control is much harder. The thing isn't designed. To have uh, separate compartments with integrity that stop it sinking. Yeah, but- so there, there are real uh, certification and safety issues, but I'm saying resolve them and have the thing pop out like bunny rabbits. Well, look, can we can the credibility of Australia really suffer yet another failed shipbuilding program after yeah. blowing four billion dollars on the attack class? Can we really afford another failed shipbuilding Maybe program? The real I mean, we're, reason- we're starting to look like the U.S. Navy yes. with all of these failed programs. Well, we're a fast follower of the U.S. <laughs> Navy, remember? So as the U.S. Navy disappears by failed investments in in programs like the Constellation class that is going down the same track that the Hunters are going and down, and the Zumwalt, we will follow them down that track of shrinking numbers. Maybe, though, the reason for this is the goldfish phenomenon. The goldfish the, phenomenon. The You've gullible referred to this goldfish. Before, Michael. Tell us about the goldfish phenomenon. Well, the gullible goldfish is this fish that when it hears something, it gets really excited, feels very positive, mm-hmm. and then forgets about it. Mm. And it can be this long-lived goldfish. Years later, the same news is brought out and the gullible goldfish notices it, gets very excited just for a few moments and then forgets again. Well, I, I might say that it may only be months in the case of the, in the Australian defence context. What are we talking about? Oh, CRS report. That was a little joke about me forgetting. Ah, yeah. sorry, yeah. I fell for it every, yeah. so, fell but, for it every time. I'm, I'm trying to say the OPVs, because they've been constructed at Henderson, Henderson is being re- reimaginificated now because there was this big announcement from oh, nice segue, uh, Richard Miles mm-hmm. about the Henderson precinct, which is going to have dry docks for ships and submarines. It's going to be a whole consolidation of shipbuilding there for maintenance and construction mm, purposes. Okay. $20 billion, I think, was in the background information provided to journalists. Then Not you look at, actually in the media release, though, well, in black and white. I looked back, continuous name. Naval Shipbuilding, Henderson, Then, when, when Continuous Naval Shipbuilding was announced in 2017, Henderson was the second precinct. Mm. It was going to do non-major warship construction mm. with a consolidated, rebuilt Henderson precinct. That was 2017. And now here <coughs> we are in 2024, and lo and behold, the Henderson 
precinct is going to be consolidated for shipbuilding and maintenance. Hmm. $20 billion apparently, but then I looked at the actual announcement. It's, it's not funding, $20 billion. It's not $20 billion and it's not actually any activity in Henderson. It's pre-feasibility studies of what might potentially be done at Henderson. Hmm. For how much money? $125 million to an engineering advisory so, company called Bechtel that in about three years will produce some potential designs for potential government consideration and perhaps a decision to then so, begin on, a the tender th- process. The three years. So it's three years and a bit since the AUKUS announcement. Is yes. that the three years you're talking about? No, and no, I'm talking about three more years. Well, three more years. So, so hang these- on, three plus three. That's so six years after the original yes. AUKUS submarine announcement. Yes. We will have done some the studies yes. to tell us what to do at Henderson. Well, to allow a decision on potential options for what the Henderson consolidated precinct might be. Right. So this work is about supporting Submarine Rotation Force West, so the US submarines that will be operating... Uh, No, I would say the Force West, the, the Rotation Force West... Luckily, it will happen before these pre-feasibility, pre-feasibility studies complete. Okay. So they, the actual submarines so they can be an input. The Henderson well, they might, but, but they can be an input to the pre-feasibility study. Okay. And I'm, I'm hopeful, actually, that the arrival of the first Australian flag, Virginia, uh, that is meant to happen in 2032, might also help elaborate the post-feasibility potential decision-making. Mm. Okay. So hang on, if we so late twenty twenty four, yes, today another three years, end of twenty twenty seven. That's yes. when we'll know what work we have to do to support submarines and shipbuilding. No, no, at that, that's when we'll have a clear set of options about what we might do. Okay, and then that would allow a decision to be taken, which would then allow the beginning of a procurement process to begin to specify the requirements for which of those options is accepted that might actually be subject to a tendering and procurement oh, process, okay. which that can't take more than about four years after that. So, right. so I'd okay. say we could be only seven years from now, which is only 10 years from when AUKUS was begun, we could well have a major contractor identified to begin some construction work in Henderson. Okay. Now, this announcement, did it clar- I assume it clarified how this all fits in with the general purpose frigate program because that's gone out to industry and they're responding and they have to build well the first three frigates will be built in their home yard but the next eight will be built at henderson now Mm. we already have two shipbuilders at henderson we've got Austal and we've got civmec so does that actually explain how all that's meant to work so if i'm say the japanese um mitsubishi heavy industries bidding putting forward my frigate does that explain what's going Going on to them, like who's going to own the shipyard? Will they be amalgamated? Will be government-owned ship? Like, mm, does well, it say anything there? Well, that's not covered in the announcement, but I, oh, okay. I think the only sensible thing to do is to delay that building program until the Henderson precinct is uh, designed and constructed because the real danger here, the big danger for continuous shipbuilding in our country is people get ahead of themselves. They get ahead of themselves. (laughs) And so if you've got someone like Mitsubishi or or the South Koreans piling in there to Henderson building a ship, just when you're trying to get the precinct right, that's just going to get in the way, isn't it? So I would hope they're going to delay that build of the general purpose frigate until sometime in the mid 2030s to allow mm. the world's best digital shipyard and maintenance facility to be constructed at Henderson. Well, I'm just sort of trying to do the maths here because the first three general purpose frigates, first one's meant to come around, say, 2029, built overseas, and then you get the next ones in 2030, 31, 32. So we'll be hoping to get the first Australian built one in 2033. So, so it takes you, you three years to build the thing. You've got to have the facility to build it in operating in 2030. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I'd say well before then, but I don't know. The the numbers, the timeline's looking pretty tight here, Michael. I think, I think we need to do a study into the feasibility of the timelines. I just think we need to look forward to the next announcement of a potential future option for decision. But, but the good thing I will say is that with the Henderson Precinct announcement, the government did put out a cartoon of what the ship built. <laughs> That's true. I mean, a $20 billion what? announcement that turned into a $125 million pre-feasibility study. With a and cartoon. With a small cartoon. Uh, look, which- look, I'm looking at this. There's, there's some sheds. 
I mean, it's pretty good. There's some sheds. There's a couple of ships. There's a, there's a thing called a floating dock, and there is a depot level maintenance. Do- I mean, so I, I it's all there. I mean, what more? You, do you know need? what was missing from that cartoon? The ten thousand workers. There, there was I no don't see any workers there. there. But the other thing that was missing was that little warning on the bottom. You know, artist illustration um, <laughs> resemblance to anything real or imagined is is uh, only only elliptic. It does say indicative pictorial of some <laughs> elements of the proposed Henderson defense pre thing it precinct, is very funny isn't it? which will be refined as planning design and feasibility studies yeah. are proved yeah. but but the goldfish precinct boundaries are to be determined so we don't actually know where the precinct is well and it's not all obviously in commonwealth ownership there's a lot of private ownership there'll be some state government ownership just the planning and development process is years long after the pre-feasibility anyway the gullible goldfish was very happy to get that announcement and the gullible goldfish had only just assimilated another problem which was the congressional research service in in america had come out with this extraordinary report saying that at the time of the orca submarine announcement there was no proper analysis of alternatives saying whether this was the best path or whether something else like b21s mm. might have been a more viable and effective and, and they kindly proposed some other options they did they said, so but when did this report come out michael it was just this month ha- but hang on didn't we cover this well that's because a, a, a year ago yes but that's because this is an update to a series of reports and the congressional research service has been making this point in these reports for over a year now. So, hang on, what you're saying is there's nothing new in this big media flash that has caught everybody's attention. Well, the goldfish saw it, and so the goldfish was alarmed. But I, I think it's a very good thing that this excellent analysis by a, a the Congressional Research Service is now circulating in Australia. But I expect the goldfish to go back to sleep again and only be surprised when the next version of this report comes yeah. out. Look, I will make a serious point about the CRS report. So there's a couple of things. First is, yes, the CRS, they simply provide advice to Congress about upcoming decisions that Congress will have to make, essentially Mm. to approve legislation and spending put forward by the administration. To give them a a good information basis to make decisions. So what the CRS is saying is not anything put forward by the administration. It is certainly not the Biden administration's yep. position is certainly not the position of any congressional committee. So yep. it is simply you know, analysis, this, this bunch, analysis done over yep. here. What is uh, interesting, however, is as somebody who's been consuming CRS reports for many years, and they are excellent, the gold standard, I have can't remember them ever actually doing something like this, of actually no. proposing An some alternative. alternatives yeah. other than what the administration is proposing to Congress. Yes. And I, to, my, to me, it's a sense of their kind of frustration at, at AUKUS, at the ham-fisted way that Australia got into it without proper analysis, you know, without the sort of due diligence that they would expect a country like Australia, which they see as analogous to mm. a, the US as a robust Western democracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think they're kind of frustrated, partly because they're going, they've seen the decline of the US Navy over the last sort of 30 yes. years as the, yeah, and they, the, they, the inshittification of US naval shipbuilding. There's an implicit uh, thought in that Congressional Research Service report that Australia is better than this, that we're smarter and that we won't (laughs) fall into the same obvious pitfall of declining capability that the US Navy is in. Yeah, so they're sort of disappointed that we've done as badly as the US. But I think there, there is also genuine concern there that, hang on, the US Navy is going backwards in terms of ship and submarine numbers. How is that going to be helped by handing submarines over to Australia? So I think there is genuine concern yes. there. So it's an yes. in, it's important stuff. Yes, it is just a little funny that it's been out for over a year and the media have rediscovered it once again. Well, I think it's good people are reading those reports and I hope they read further reports also from people like the Congressional budget office because that kind of analysis is not available here in Australia. Now, analysis not available here in Australia brings me to uh, the the last issue, which is about missiles. Mm. So the gullible goldfish, again, has been very excited to learn today when we're recording this podcast that there's been a, a deal, a $7 billion deal struck with the Americans by Industry and Capability Delivery Minister Pat Conroy uh, to get SM2 Block 3C missiles for our Navy ships mm-hmm. and also SM6 missiles. And he said this is a 
wonderful example of this government accelerating capability. Accelerating. accelerating Is this the word we don't think it means what you think it means? Well, Inigo Montoya made that point. Uh, yes, here is Pat Conroy demonstrating that he doesn't know what acceleration well, means in normal parlance. As I cast my mind back... I seem to recall the previous government announcing SM6 numerous times, actually, Mm -hmm. and announcing a cooperative program with the US where we would participate in the development of SM6. So I'm sort of, which bit of this is new? Well, I was, I looked at the DSCA site, which is the US body that approves these sales and notifies Congress. Mm -hmm. And there was a a 26th of October announcement there about SM2s, about Australia getting 17 of them Mm -hmm. for 46 million US. October this year? Uh, Well, it turns out it was 2010, actually, 14 years ago. (laughs) So after 14 years, we are now buying some actual missiles for use, apparently. Look, uh, we have bought actual SM2s and we do have them on on our three oh, I'm, actual, I'm just saying this, this is not a new classes, program. But this is no, not a new program. SM6 this is not acceleration. Is, has been announced many, many times. Now, well, in, SM6, in the recent announcement, does it say when we're actually going to have real SM6s on a real Australian warship? Does it give a date there? Uh, what is missing in uh, Minister Comroy's accelerated announcement is a time frame for getting oh. these weapons. It's a bit hard to uh, measure numbers, acceleration without Numbers time. of missiles that are being acquired and any detail about resupply or is this just a one-off purchase? Mm-hmm. So, And which ships are they going on? They're Well, they're going on three ships that the Navy actually has. The Hobart. The Hobart class the, air warfare You mean the ones that are about to go into an extensive upgrade? The ones that are going out of service for an extensive upgrade, So they yes. can use the SM-6. That's right. Yes. But they're also potentially going on... Mm. The general purpose frigates, and you'll be pleased to know the Hunter frigates. The Hunter? When, when is the first Hunter going to be in service? Uh, if it's on schedule, I yep. think uh, the Navy gets it in 2032. It probably won't be operational well, I think for IOC another couple is of years. 2034. So. Yeah. Okay, so a decade so, from well, we now. We might actually have some SM6s by then. Well, you can see why we've got to accelerate this. Mm. So, the, yeah, this is another major example of this disconnect between words and reality all this talk of acceleration uh, equipping our ships with defensive capabilities because these are predominantly defensive missiles you can use both missiles to uh, hit ships but it's a very expensive it bad way of doing it. expensive very expensive bad way yep. doing. Uh, but this in the 2016 defense white paper there was uh, air and missile defense is a priority in the 2020 for structure review of the previous government there was 15 to 22 billion dollars for air and missile defense and separate money for maritime uh, mm-hmm. defense now we're spending we're getting an announcement about seven billion dollars mm. which is about a third of what was in the previous budget plan and we're being told it's accelerated but it's being fitted mainly to ships that the navy isn't going to get <laughs> For a decade or more. The thing is beyond parity. It is. uh, There is a certain black humour to this, I have to say. But I think we can maybe make some sense of it if we refer to this little booklet that you were kind enough to share with me. Well, I had to turn up to a police station and not for any crime I'd committed. Uh, It was for another purpose that I won't bore listeners with. But I picked up this thing. And it it is called called The Little Black Book of Scams. And it's from the Anti-Scam Centre, the National Anti-Scam Centre. And I was flipping through this and here are some of the scams we need to be looking out for. First one, impersonation scams. Scammers deceive you into thinking they are from trusted organisations such as the police, government, banks and well-known businesses. I mean, that sounds a bit like naval shipbuilding. We're from trust. the government. Yeah, you could trust us. We're, trust here to help. us. We're going to work with this large, well-known business to deliver you some ships. Believe us. <laughs> scam alert. Then, Another scam. Jobs and employment scams. Scammers offer jobs that pay well with little effort. They pretend to be hiring on behalf of high-profile companies. Sometimes the job they list doesn't even exist, such as... <laughs> shipbuilding and ship Henderson. Submarine building. Construction workers in Western Australian shipyards. And... 
And but I think this is probably the one we really need to look out for most of all. Is this an AUKUS alert? Yes. Romance scams. Scammers use the promise of love, dating or friendship to get your money. They go to great lengths to convince you the relationship is real and manipulate you to give them money. Now, my own editorial comment here is generally the scams work because the the victim, the sucker, is only too willing to hand over the money. They can't do it fast enough. And perhaps the $4.7 billion we're handing to the US and the other $4.7 billion we're handing to the UK, our other online dating scammer, is an illustration of there is still a sucker born every minute. Well, I've got a more positive view of this. It just, it shows to me that in our troubled, dangerous, fragmenting world, that romance is not dead. So I actually think it's beautiful about the Australian character that, that we can fall in love and that we are trusting. Anyway, the little black book of scams. Richard Miles might want to go and get a copy from his local police station and maybe it'll open his eyes a little to some some p- potential pitfalls out there. <laughs> but finally, we have one final last this, piece of good news. There is some good news. Tanks, my friend. Tanks. tanks. So after... Over a year of deep cogitation, uh, Richard Miles has announced that 49 of Australia's 59 retiring M1A1 Abrams tanks are being given to Ukraine. So it this, was, it was this is a very hard, news. complex decision, Michael. I mean, a lot of factors to consider. Many factors. I think one of them, from what I heard, uh, a big factor here was when the Defence Disposals Boards got their hands on these tanks, they used their best equipment, uh, but they their just... sharpest chainsaw. They sharpest chainsaw, biggest spanners. They just could not cut into these things. I mean, the MRH-90 helicopters were child's Easy. play. Easy. I mean, they're so, composites. I mean, in the interest of protecting the health and safety of those disposals people that did such a rapid job with the Type A helicopters, mm-hmm. there had to be another path. All right. And, and the that, Ukrainians that path are the path le- leads to Ukraine. Although, again, this announcement, no detail of timeline, no detail of the logistics package that's going, no detail at all. And in fact, just a disturbing little rider that's something about, well, now it's up to us getting the uh, requisite approvals from the US government about this transfer. So... I just hear a, a series of roadblocks in the way of these tanks actually getting to the Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. And I would like some honesty and openness from the government about the timeline for mm-hmm. implementation of this decision. Honesty and openness about timelines. Well, I think that could be a little little challenging. Well, if we mind. don't get it, it'll but be yet another chapter in the little book of scams. Well, and hopefully we're not going to strip them for parts to sell on the, the open market before we send them. Yeah, well, I'll be watching Pickles online auctions for M1A1 parts for that purpose. And, uh, look, I will also just, just note that uh, Mr. Miles has, you know, emphasised the, the scale of Australia's contributions to Ukraine fighting the good fight. But if you actually do the math, it turns out that each Australian... The government has given to Ukraine on behalf of each Australian, by my calculation, well under well under 50 cents a week since the start of the war. So, Australians are paying even more for the ABC, aren't they? So, yeah. you know, I, I don't think, you know, we can say we've been overly generous to, in uh, supporting Ukraine's fight well, for survival and democracy. Well, there's a smarter democracy. way to help the Ukrainians, uh, aside from giving them our cast-offs from our own military, and that is to give Australian companies that make stuff the Ukrainians want desperately contracts because then that money goes to Aussie jobs and the Aussie economy. My view about these numbers we get from the government about military support to Ukraine is it's the only area of government activity where they're pro-inflation. Anyway, it's still good news. So let's end on that happy note. All right. And let's hope there's more good news that doesn't take an agonised year to make an obvious decision. Marcus, great to talk with you. Thank you, Michael.